When I was a teenager, I convinced my grandfather to split the cost of a 16-foot aluminum works gift. He was a retired New York City fireman. He moved to Rhode Island. He wanted to use the boat to put around Charlestown Pond, a salt pond, saltwater lagoon in the southern part of Rhode Island. I wanted to use the boat to catch shellfish and trap eels. This is an eel pot. To catch eels, first you have to catch the bait. I'd use horseshoe crabs. It's probably illegal to use horseshoe crabs now, but this is 20 years ago. So I'd catch the horseshoe crabs, I'd put them in a chest freezer, and I'd quarter them up, put a quarter of a eel, a quarter of a horseshoe crab in the pot, and right before the sun goes down, set the pot with the funnel facing the eel grass. And at night, the eels would patrol the shoreline looking for food. They'd smell the horseshoe crab. They'd nose their way around the pot, find their way into the funnel, and they couldn't get out. In the morning, haul the pot, empty the eels into a basket, but it wasn't that easy. Eels don't go just right into a basket. Eels find their way out of the basket, and they wind up squirming around the deck of the boat, and they're not easy to catch. So this boat, it's an aluminum boat, and it had these ribs in it for support. Inside was these uh, metal ribs, and the eels could find their way inside the ribs, and they couldn't find their way out, and I couldn't get them out. I don't think my grandfather ever used that boat once on his own. And I'm not sure if it was because I was on the boat all the time, or he was getting old, or it was probably because the boat smelled so bad <laughs> with the dead eels in the ribs of the boat. But my eel catching business didn't last very long. It was before I had a driver's license, so I was relying on my mom's Oldsmobile um, to get the eels to the guy who used to buy them for two bucks a pound and ship them to Italy. The small one would get used here for striped bass bait, the big ones get shipped to Italy for food. So I, you know, dress the back of my mom's trunk with uh, garbage bags and put the basket of eels on there and we'd go down the road. And so my mother was certainly excited that I gave up on the eel business, but I stuck with the shellfish business. I continued to dig shellfish and I really enjoyed that. Um, I learned that scuba diving for shellfish was a more efficient means of capturing shellfish and scuba diving wasn't allowed in Charlestown Pond, so I went uh, to the salt pond east of there, Point Judith Pond, another saltwater pond here in Rhode Island, uh, where I could scuba dive for shellfish. When I was in that pond, I immediately noticed between Beach Island and Gardner Island, this array of gray and black buoys, all aligned straight, it really irked me. It was an oyster farm, and it really bothered me that I wasn't able to dig shellfish there, even though never in a million years would I have dropped anchor and dug, oyster, dug, dug clams in, in this uh, in this area because the, the bottom wasn't suitable, there wasn't any wild shellfish there, but it bothered me every time I passed it or drove through it. Years later, I found myself studying aquaculture at University of Rhode Island, and that man that owned that oyster farm, Bob Bro, he became one of my most important mentors. I was fortunate enough throughout my life to have both blue-collar, hands-on, as well as academic mentors to teach me my trade, which is aquaculture. Aquaculture is the growing of aquatic organisms. It's the fastest growing food producing industry in the world. It's growing the fastest in Africa, where the population growth is happening the most. It exists the most in Asia. China makes up over 60% of our world's total production of aquaculture. Here in Rhode Island, we grow oysters. To understand how we grow oysters, you have to know a little bit about biology. Oysters, like most things in nature, react to a temperature spawning cue. This is the slide you all came for today, is the oyster reproduction <laughs> slide. When the water temperature warms up to around 68 degrees, the oysters put their male and female gametes, their egg and sperm, in the water, and fertilization happens in the water when those gametes randomly collide with each other. The chances of that happening is very small, so the oysters spawn millions. One female oyster puts eight million egg in the water column. One male oyster puts enough milk in the water to fertilize that of seven female oysters. Think about that next time you're swimming in July. <laughs> but that's how they do it. So if that random chance does happen where the male and female gamete run into each other, you have a soft-bodied animal, a villager. It's free swimming. It can't swim against the current, but it can suspend itself in the water. It's looking for a substrate to attach onto, like a rock or a shell. Once it finds a substrate to attach onto, like a rock or a shell, something with calcium carbonate is what it really wants to attach onto, it starts to crystallize onto that 
substrate. It glues itself onto that substrate, crystallizing calcium carbonate that naturally occurs in the water, much like ice forms, and it stays there for the rest of its life. Now, it's a really hardy animal. It can attach onto a rock at high tide, which then gets exposed at low tide and gets exposed to all the elements, really hot, really cold, and everything in between. The oldest living animal ever found was a 500-year-old oyster. So these animals are uh, very hardy. As a farmer, we rely on hatcheries to get our seed. And like any farmer, we want to get our seed in the spring. In the hatchery, they take male and female oysters, and they gradually raise the temperature of the water. Oysters are sequential hermaphrodites, so they start their life as male, and at some point in their life, they change to female. So it's safe to assume a larger oyster is a female, smaller oyster is a male, and they put a few hundred brood stock, a few hundred parent stock oysters in a tank. In February, they're mimicking the temperatures of April. By the time April rolls around, mimicking the temperatures of July. And now the oysters are putting their massive numbers of male and female gametes in the water. Remember how many gametes each oyster puts in the water. And now this is happening with hundreds of oysters in a controlled setting in the tank, resulting in billions and billions of fertilized larvae. That's what the fertilized larvae look like under a microscope. They look like hard shell clams, but they're actually oyster larvae. At this stage is the only point where humans are actually feeding the oysters. In the hatchery, they have to grow a monoculture, a single species culture of the right size algae for these oyster larvae to consume. And that might be the trickiest part of growing oysters. So they grow different species of algae and drip that algae into the tank and hopefully that oyster larvae is happy and healthy and wants to undergo metamorphosis by attaching onto a rock or a shell. But I don't want to sell an oyster attached onto a rock or a shell. I just want to sell an individual animal. So in the hatchery, they grind up clam shell or oyster shell, just the shell, not the whole animal. And they make like a shell sand or a shell dust. And they present that shell to the oyster larvae in what's called a settling tank. The oyster, oyster larvae is poured into the settling tank and the larvae lands in the crushed up shell and starts to undergo metamorphosis crystallizing calcium carbonate onto that shell. And it's at that point, a grower like myself will buy the oyster seed. At that point, one million animals at one millimeter, which is about the size that they are at that point, fits in about the volume of a baseball. There's about one million oysters in the palm of my hand right there. Those oysters are then transferred into upwellers. Upwellers gradually pump water by the oysters, boosting their growth in that critical juvenile stage, taking them from one millimeter, the size you just saw, to around 15 millimeters. At that point, we take the oysters, and we have to separate the different sizes of oysters. So we take the, take the oysters and we put them in these sturdy plastic mesh bags. We measure them volumetrically. A one liter scoop of those animals fits about 1,200 animals in it. We put those oysters in a bag. This is a nine millimeter mesh bag. We seal it up and we put it in our gear, and the oysters stay there for a few months of growing, and after a while, we'll take them out, remove any predators, clean off any biofouling from the bags, and as the oysters get larger, we have to separate the size classes. The larger ones go in larger mesh bags to allow more water to move through the bag, to allow them to grow. So oyster farming, uh, it's very much farming, tradi like traditional farming. There's parasites, predators, disease. Um, we're constantly trying to increase survival, decrease mortality, increase growth, decrease predation. Oyster farming is sustainable agriculture. It's the epitome of sustainable agriculture. We put these animals in the water, and they start filtering the water. They're eating phytoplankton, microscopic plants that are naturally occurring in the water, so we're not feeding them. But by the way, in the mechanism by which they feed, it cleans the water. Now, the phytoplankton they're eating isn't bad for the environment. However, phytoplankton, when the sun comes up, photosynthesize all day. And when the sun comes down, when the sun goes down, they respirate, they breathe, they take oxygen out of the water. So after a long, hot day, there's a lot of phytoplankton in the water. That can lead to low oxygen levels uh, and can lead to anoxic or hypoxic situations where uh, often leads to fish kills, if you've ever seen a beach or a pond strewn with hundreds of thousands of dead fish, almost always after a long, hot day. Shellfish and other filter-feeding organisms reduce that occurrence from happening and the increased oxygen available to other living things. Shellfish aquaculture increases biodiversity. There's 10 to 10,000 times more living organisms within an oyster farm than in an adjacent water body. 
Shellfish increase the amount of light that can penetrate to the sea floor. They reduce turbidity in the water. By increasing the amount of sunlight that can penetrate and hit the sea floor, it increases aquatic vegetation growth, which is essential fish habitat. And that's very important because these farms exist in bays, estuaries, salt ponds, which provide habitat for most of the commercially important species that we capture in our commercial fishing ports. But aquaculture is a relatively new form of agriculture. It's only industrialized aquaculture. It's only been going on for a few decades. Compare that with terrestrial, traditional agriculture going on for centuries. So we haven't figured out the best ways to do things. So we've come up with a couple, a couple simple innovations over the years that I've been doing this. One of them is that upweller that you saw. Another one's this tumbler. I used to, to separate the size class of oysters, put the oysters in a, a sieve and shake it like this, like I was sieving for gold. The small ones would fall out into a tote. The other ones I'd dump out into another tote and we'd keep them separate. If the big oysters stay in the same containment as the small oysters, the big oysters outcompete the small ones, the small ones die. So by separating the size classes, you're increasing survival. So this mechanism, the tumbler, automatically does that. We have to manually dump the oysters in the hopper. The oysters are fed up uh, through a conveyor belt and dumped into that hopper, which spins around. The small ones come out at the beginning. The big ones come out at the end. And we put them back in these bags in their respective size classes. Another innovation is floating gear. So forever, I'd use bottom culture oysters um, gear. and these mud crabs were our most efficient predator. The mud crabs would come out of the mud, munch away at the edge of the shell, consume the fleshy part of the oyster, and move on to the next one. And they're really efficient predators. So by using this floating gear, we keep them away from the mud crabs and drastically reduce predation. We're also, that's what the uh, floating gear looks like in, in rows, just like rows of corn, uh, rows of vegetables at a vegetable farm. There are rows of different size classes, different year classes of oysters in the floating gear, as well as the submerged gear in between those lines. We're also experimenting with different species. This is a native species uh, of bay scallops. Right now, you can go down the street to a grocery store and buy bay scallops for about 10 bucks a pound, and chances are they came from China. A group of scientists a few decades ago came to Connecticut, the Milford Noah Laboratory, and left with a few dozen bay scallops, the species native to the Northeast. They introduced them to China, and they figured out how to grow them so efficiently and ship them back to us, and we can't even compete. Ac seafood is the United States' number two import. The only thing we import more than seafood is energy, oil. Most of what we, far most of what we import is farm-raised. So I'm excited about the prospect of being able to grow our own scallops. Our innovations have led to challenges, social challenges. Not everybody wants to see a tumbler on their neighbor's dock. Some people are afraid that scallop farms might interfere with their water skiing and tubing. Some people don't want to see floating gear on their waterways. And I can relate to that. I remember clearly, day after day, being so frustrated by that one person's business that I knew nothing about. I do know that farming our waters is going to play an integral part of the balance between recreational and commercial fishing, the commer recreational and commercial use of our waterways. As farmers, it's no longer our job just to come up with innovative ways to, simple but innovative ways to grow our product. We're also going to be responsible to engage in dialogue, education, and even conflict in order to meet our goals, in order to create a more resilient and self-reliant food production system so that someday we can walk down the street and go into the grocery store and buy farm-raised base scallops grown here in Rhode Island. Thank you.